Good afternoon and welcome to our long COVID and post viral syndrome echo with the University of Utah Health and Bateman Horn Center. I'm Talia Rescioni, the Education Director at the Bateman Horn Center, and I run these sessions with Project Echo Manager Sarah Day. Today we're going to be hearing from FNP Jennifer Bell and CMHC Paige Zuckerman as they discuss navigating mental health considerations in MECFS, PASC, and dysautonomia. I'm going to turn the time over to you, Paige. All right. Thank you, everybody. We'll go ahead and get our screen share up and going. All right. So let's start with a little bit of an introduction. I'll introduce myself and then I'll let Jen take a, a moment as well. My name is Paige Zuckerman. I'm a clinical mental health counselor coming from the world of educational psychology. I'm the co-executive and clinical director of Red Willow Counseling and Recovery, which is a space that specializes in substance abuse recovery and clinical mental health, including specializing in chronic illness, chronic pain, medical trauma, and disability. And that's the world that I come from is 18 years of mental health and 11 of those in disability psychology specifically. Jen, you can go ahead and introduce yourself as well. Okay. I'm Jennifer Bell. I'm a family nurse practitioner at the Bateman Horn Center. And I have been working at the Bateman Horn Center for three years and was brought on to develop their long COVID program. Prior to that, I did primarily primary care, internal medicine, and women's health. And it has been quite an experience to work here and deal with this illness. So let's talk a little bit about our objectives today, what we hope that y'all can walk away with in this conversation. The first thing we want to do is really recognize and challenge some of the prevailing perspectives that some of the symptoms that we're going to talk about have a primarily psychiatric etiology and recognize that some of these things are actually difficult to diagnose indicators of things like sympathetic overdrive, cognitive issues, and fatigue, and may actually be like the whispers of a neuroinflammatory or chronic illness that has been yet to be diagnosed. And how do we kind of differentiate and, and be really smart about the way that we're diagnosing as well as recommending care plans? To think about the primary versus secondary presentations and how do we maybe look at psych-based symptoms as, in fact, secondary to chronic illness etiology? And how do we begin to kind of combine care, essentially, in a really thoughtful way? We're also going to provide some case examples. And what I love about this part of it is Jen and I have this opportunity to provide case examples that look at the different clinics in which folks might be presenting for care. In my case, what happens when someone presents to a mental health facility? And in the case of Jen, somebody who presents for like, you know, specialist care for chronic illness. And, you know, you'll get to see a little bit of the similarities and differences of why someone shows up at our door um, and how that might look differently as well as what are the significant overlaps. And then, you know, I'd really love for us to end this conversation today with kind of a invitation, a call to action, as it were, for how we can be better at concurrent care between mental health and medical and making sure that we're really working in a handshake together to differentially diagnose and properly treat folks that may be presenting with these concerns. So the first thing I want to just acknowledge, validate, recognize is that this is difficult, right? This is difficult for our patients. This is difficult for us. I really like some of the information that came out of a 2018 Euler study, and this is the European Alliance of Associations for Rheumatology. This study, I believe, as I'm recalling right, had 300 some odd initial respondents. One third of those respondents with eventually a confirmed rheumatological disease, initially reported that it took up to 10 years or more for them to receive that official diagnosis. Uh, along the way in that difficult process of a decade or more, 96% of these folks received at least one misdiagnosis, and 36% of them received one or more uh, diagnoses of a psychogenic disorder. So they were told along the way, you have conversion disorder, you have factitious disorder, you have health anxiety, you have OCD, you have PTSD, 
Um, so that often, in a lot of cases for folks, over a third of them, that was the initial diagnosis that was given to them. And in some cases, they received that from multiple providers along the way. And in a 2015 IOM report specifically for ME-CFS patients, 84 to 91% of patients affected still haven't been diagnosed. So waiting to get an answer and a differential diagnosis, and probably also along the way, have received some questions from providers or family or support networks of, well, is it maybe that you're just depressed or maybe you're just anxious, sort of that assumption that it's all in their head, essentially. And in a lot of cases for these folks as well, the time to diagnosis from the onset of symptoms was also five to 10 years, um, if they had even received any kind of, kind of diagnostic clarity. So these are things that are commonly experienced amongst folks with chronic illness, chronic pain, and these kinds of presenting concerns that we might end up seeing in our spaces. So I want us to be thinking about this notion of yes and, right? How do we recognize that chronic illness patients commonly present with co-occurring psych symptoms? And this is usually due to particular commonly reported factors. And these are things that were reported in the Euler study, but also I did a little bit of a sweep of, of a bunch of my clients and my group members and asked them to report their common experiences. And some of the three common themes that came out of both that study, as well as my own little sub-study within my clinic was long-term experiences of dismissal or misdiagnosis from multiple providers. And, and I want to say that's often not because of intention to misdiagnose or to do harm. It's just the differential diagnostic process is complicated, especially with these disorders and how they present. The stressors related to the process of receiving a proper medical differential diagnosis. And this included the cost of that, the burden of frequent care visits and wait times. In some cases, folks were waiting six to 12 months to see a specialist provider. And in that time, we're still struggling with pretty severe or worsening symptoms. And then there's loss, grief, and adjustment disorders that are pretty reasonable and natural as a part of acknowledging and navigating the recruit of disability, and as well as the building up of comorbidities, which are common in a lot of these presentations. So go ahead and hand it over to Jen for a moment. I'm going to talk about the three most common diagnoses that I see our patients either come in with when they're new patients or receive during their time with us from other providers. And then I'll go into three different, or sorry, two, two case studies. So functional neurologic disorder, also known as conversion disorder, based from the National Institutes of Neurologic Disorders and Stroke, this refers to a group of common neurologic movement disorders caused by an abnormality in how the brain functions. Fairly broad definition. Functional neurologic disorder is not caused by any by another disorder, and there's no significant structural damage in the brain. So when I list out the symptoms of these three, I want you to think about your patients. Symptoms of FND are often weakness, tremors, syncope, seizures, fatigue, sensory issues such as numbness, tingling, sensory sensitivities, balance issues, tics, difficulty with speech, extreme slowness and fatigue, pain, including migraines. Attributed, it's often attributed to, to prior stress or trauma and possible reaction to their chronic illness. These symptoms can come and go and can be triggered by stress or emotional or physical trauma. Anxiety, per the American Psychological Association, is an emotion characterized by feelings of tension, worried thought, and physical changes. Symptoms of common symptoms, and there are a number of different types of anxiety, but I kind of put them together. Racing heart, sweating, trembling, chest pain, fatigue, difficulty with concentration, headaches, muscle aches, unexplained pain, insomnia, OCD symptoms, and PTSD symptoms. And depression, per the National Institutes of Mental Health, is a common but serious mood disorder that can cause severe symptoms that affect how a person feels, thinks, and handles daily activities, such as sleeping, eating, or working. Common symptoms, fatigue, hypersomnia, 
body pain, headaches, impaired physical and cognitive functioning. I'm hoping that with listing out the symptoms, you're all thinking maybe we can expand this differential diagnosis a little bit from these three diagnoses. So basically, what I want you to do is think about how these symptoms can maybe help you hone down into, into maybe a possible underlying underlying cause. What could be the differential diagnosis here with these with the patient coming in with unknown unknown cause of these symptoms? Now granted, to provide some to give the emergency rooms and stuff like that a little bit of a break, they don't have the time that we have with these patients. But these diagnoses can stay with them and they can stay with them in a way that can really affect their disability. It can affect how other providers see them down the road. And so they shouldn't be given lightly without thinking about a complete, a complete differential diagnosis evaluation. So these symptoms can offer clues as to what's driving their chronic illness. So alternate diagnoses, and I know we've talked about this somewhat before, but this is narrowing down a little further. So alternate diagnoses for many of those symptoms that I listed, dysautonomia could be a, could be a diagnosis. And we see that in the form of POTS, orthostatic hypotension, neurogenic orthostatic hypotension, orthostatic intolerance, not being able to be upright for very long, syncope, slow GI motility, insomnia, PTSD and anxiety symptoms and sensory sens symptoms. There's, I know there's more. These are not all inclusive. Somebody who comes in complaining of fatigue, cognitive impairment, decreased function, a bunch of neurologic issues could also need to consider the possibility of post-exertional malaise of MECFS. And we need to consider that in our long COVID patients, particularly, maybe we haven't diagnosed them with MECFS at this point, but could they be moving in that direction? Is post-exertional malaise starting to happen? And maybe it's not a depression or, or an anxiety of their illness, but they're actually now starting to develop PEM. Fibromyalgia can cause diffuse pain, fatigue, and headaches. Small fiber neuropathy, numbness and weakness, and orthostatic intolerance and some of the sensory sensory symptoms that mentioned in the functional neurologic diagnosis include numbness, tingling, and, and weakness. Mast cell activation maybe is a little more black and white, but I can think back on patients that I probably missed that diagnosis. Well, I'm sure I missed that diagnosis. You know, maybe hives can be attributed to, to anxiety and stress. GI issues of nausea and diarrhea can be con contributed to some anxiety and depression. Food intolerances may be an anxiety presentation. Um, shortness of breath, headaches, recurrent upper respiratory and flu-like symptoms. All, all of these can sometimes be attributed to, to mental health illnesses, if not looked at more closely. And then one that where I think we're appreciating more and more in this clinic is how does hypermobility play in this? We can see when hypermobility flares, PEM really flares in these patients. Um, we see worsened cognitive impairment, worsened sympathetic overdrive, worsened body pain and headaches. So we need to be thinking about a much broader differential diagnosis. And Paige and I had a, a brief conversation about the NIH study that just came out about two weeks ago and the term used, alteration of effort preference. This study, most of you probably are, from, are aware of it. It was, it was a huge, it, was a, it, was a, it wasn't a big study in terms of numbers of people, but it was a huge effort for this study, and it was a big write-up. It's gotten a lot of press, and it provided some really great data and information about MECFS. But unfortunately, they used the term alteration of effort preference in part of their write-up. To, dis to talk about the possibility that the brain is choosing how it, how it responds. The MECFS community has in many has been upset by this, by this statement because it does suggest that the patient has a choice in how they're feeling. And so we had to be careful of using these terms because their, their illness is so often attributed to a mental health illness. And this unfortunately doesn't help with that. I don't think that's what the authors meant to say but it's the way it's coming across. So I'm going to present two case studies. This is a 55-year-old woman who has long COVID. She had a, an acute COVID infection in June 2020. She had pneumonia and was hospitalized for three days in the ICU. She was not intubated, but on her stomach the entire time. And 
was terrified she was going to die. And she remembers everything about this. There, she has none of that ICU um, um, loss of memory or amnesia that people can get. She remembers everything. And it was a very, very traumatizing experience for her. Her comorbid conditions prior to getting COVID were type 1 diabetes, hypertension, obstructive sleep apnea, multiple sclerosis, chronic, chronic liver disease, and obesity. Her post-COVID diagnoses added to her diagnoses of post-COVID ME-CFS, debilitating PTSD and anxiety, shortness of breath with low O2 sats, dysautonomia and orthostatic intolerance, cognitive impairment, and a meat intolerance. When I saw her for her lean test and cognitive testing and physical exam, she was very stressed. She was really afraid she was going to fail the testing. And she was anxious when she lay down to prepare for the lean test and anxious when she got up from the lean test. And during the lean test, and I was in the room for this, she experienced a significant fight or flight response during the lean test. She had severe shortness of breath, anxiety, dizziness, dry mouth. I kept waiting to sort of see this big response by her blood pressure and heart rate, and I didn't. Her, she had a moderate hypertensive response, and she had a somewhat increased heart rate response at 22 beats per minute, which isn't to say she didn't have some level, but it did not match what I was seeing symptomatically for her. And so we then did her post-test cognitive testing, which she had done before, before the lean test, and she had failed so much of it, we couldn't, we couldn't calculate it. There were so many wrong, wrong answers. Her physical exam was pretty normal. She had some impaired balance, but other than that, it was relatively normal. Her psychiatric meds that she came to me on were acetalopram and prozosin for the uh, nightmares. And her cognitive impairment, any kind of cognitive or emotional exertion caused severe fatigue. It caused, she, she stated, it caused significant loss of short-term memory, confusion, feeling overwhelmed, and poor processing. And then when she was hit with a lot of sensory stimulation or any kind of stress or pressure, all of these cognitive symptoms really, really worsened. The other thing that worsened it was being upright and moving around worsened her cognitive impairment significantly, which would kick off, kick off this reaction. The next day when I met with her and discussed all of my findings with her, I asked her, so what, what happened in the testing with you that day? yesterday and she said I was afraid I was going to fail and I it just it increased my it, my cognition started getting worse and worse and worse and everything sort of fell apart so after a lot more discussion I kind of started thinking maybe cognitive and physical exertion worsened PEM and increases cognitive impairment and fatigue which can then worsen her anxiety and PTSD I decided because it really couldn't treat her dysautonomia the way I was used to treating it. Um, and this was fairly early on in my my learning curve and all of this. But I did know that low-dose naltrexone had been found to help people with long cognitive impairment of long COVID. So I said, well, why don't we start with low-dose naltrexone and see if we can clear some of the cognition up. And within two to four weeks, she had a 50% improvement in her cognition. And her PTSD and anxiety had started started to drop to the point to where she could now start entertaining working more, even from home. She was able to work more. We started. I also then initiated some aripiprazole a little bit later on, which really helped her sensory sensitivities. She was still having difficulty dealing with noise, light, and even fabric visual sensory overload. It was really kick in her cognition and kick in her. Sorry, it would kick in her fight or flight response. I also added some NAC, N-acetylcysteine, 900 milligrams. This was based off the Yale study that came about out about guanfacine and NAC for post-COVID cognitive impairment. I didn't start her at NAC because she was already on prozosin. A little later on, I, I think I also put her, I don't know the exact timing, I put her on some dextromethorphan for dysautonomia. I initiated a little bit of clonidine at night, and we dropped her prozosin down to see if we could bring that sympathetic drive down a little bit more. And the stellate ganglion block she had in May 2023 really helped quite a bit. She hasn't wanted to go back for a second one because she did not like the procedure, and she just doesn't feel she can do it again. 
And she's also been very faithful on neurobiofeedback programs and neuroplasticity programs. All of these things move the, has moved the needle to the point to where she has been able to go back to work full time. Her anxiety and PTSD, while not totally gone, is definitely improved. Her cognition is improved. Sensory overload is improved. She can go to church. She can play the organ in church. She can handle all of that. Stress and exertion can still exacerbate her PTSD symptoms, so we're continuing to work on that. And she still has some physical impairment, but it's much better. She has much better upright tolerance. So case example number two, this is a really my most complex patient. She's very severely ill, but there are two situations I wanted to bring to light. She's a 37-year-old woman with post-COVID ME-CFS. She's been sick since October 2020. Prior to COVID, she was very healthy, no health issues at all, very physically active. Since COVID, her, she now has severe POTS, mast cell. We're working her up for, we know she has hypermobility and we're working her up for CCI, fibromyalgia, and significant anxiety and depression that worsen with PEM. Her overall condition is severely ill and bedbound. I started working with her in April 2021. There was a lot I did not know at that time. <laughs> and I wish I could go back and start over again because I would do things differently, but this is how we learn. Pretty quickly on, whenever I would try a medication on her, of any sort, she would have a significant reaction and it would put her into PEM. Over the summer, that following summer, she went in and out of PEM and her PEM presented as significant headaches, body aches, and then suicidal ideation, severe depression symptoms, and these neurologic tics. And these tics were usually screaming out obscenities and violent thoughts to her children. Very disconcerting to her, understandably so. When she wasn't in PEM, her she didn't have any depression. She was happy, you know, even though she was sick, she was happy, very engaging, and would say, I don't feel depressed. This is so weird. I don't understand this. She was she is working with a mental health provider who understands chronic illness. But at some point during August, I tried her on fluvox, fluoxamine, no fluvoxamine, and she didn't tolerate that. She had a pretty significant reaction to that. And then she went into a really deep depressive episode or suicidal ideation episode, I should say, to the point to where among the therapists, myself and her husband, we felt we had to hospitalize her for psychiatric evaluation. We did that. She was in there for three days. It was not a great experience, to put it lightly, but it gave us all some perspective. She was diagnosed with major depressive episode and discharged on 80 milligrams of, flu of fluoxetine. Over the next couple of months, we talked quite a bit. The fluoxetine seemed to be helping, but it also was really affecting her sleep. And I slowly and carefully reduced her fluoxetine down to the point of where eventually we went off of it. And in hindsight, I can look back and now since not even hindsight, but knowing her more now and watching her PEM worsen and worsen, I think her suicidal ideation was secondary to worsen neuroinflammation PEM. Yes, she has some depression and anxiety, but it's not the main driver of what was going on with her. That was a really, really good learning experience for me. And it was scary, to be very honest. <laughs> the whole thing was. The second thing that was challenging was in December of 2022, so a year and a half later, she was experiencing a severe PEM episode with severe headaches, body aches, pretty much in bed. Um, we had tried everything to knock the headaches out. I decided to try some indomethacin on her. We had tried a lot of other medicines. They hadn't worked. In hindsight, that was not a good choice to use the indomethacin, but I did. She took one 25 milligram pill, I was trying to see if I, could, if I could break the cycle of the headache. And within 40 minutes of taking the pill, she started to have a severe reaction of nausea, feeling faint, heart racing, chills, sweats, eyes rolling back. Her daughter was with her at the time. And then panic and slurred, she started having a panic attack, slurred speech and couldn't walk. She texted me, I was in with a patient, she texted me that when this was starting to happen, when I saw the text, I had my MA call call her and we called 
the paramedics. She ended him in the end up in the ER with a full workup, labs, headache, head CT, and her exam, which was all completely normal. She spent the next three or four hours in there, very, very miserable, having a lot of symptoms and terrified. Her husband was with her. And out in the hallway, the a lot of the staff was, she could hear them talking, were saying this is psychiatric. We don't know what's wrong with her. You know, this there's nothing wrong with her. She was eventually formally diagnosed with a functional neurologic disorder that is now in her, her medical chart. Not only was this traumatizing and for her, it could affect her ability to get long-term disability. And in hindsight, I now understand that she had a severe dysautonomic reaction to the endomethacin. And we now, we see this, we understand this more now, but this is from her dysautonomy, not because she was... Um, having a stress response to a chronic illness. So these have long, these kinds of diagnoses can have long, long lasting impacts and can also misdirect your care. So I hope these examples are helpful in highlighting this. So yeah, let's talk about how some of these cases might look when they present first to mental health. These are a couple of my, we call them clients in my end of the world rather than patients. First example is a an individual assigned female at birth, early 30s and white. This person had gotten a prior diagnosis several within the psych realm. They'd been given the diagnosis of psychogenic seizures, panic disorder, and major depressive disorder. This had been by family medicine and psychiatry for about five years before they ever sought mental health care. They reached out to me and we started doing some work with just kind of understanding what was happening for them somatically. We were kind of looking at their care from a polyvagal standpoint, did some mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, some MBSR, mindfulness-based stress reduction, began to address the chronic depressive symptoms. And it seemed as though those symptoms were really secondary to the disability accrual that this individual had presented with over the past few years, as well as pretty marked family hostility regarding her attempts to seek care and get a medical diagnosis for her symptoms. So was receiving a lot of questioning and real direct non-support from her entire family of origin with exception to her partner. This person actually shortly after seeing me had begun receiving care at the Bateman Horn Center. This was many years ago, kind of early on. And they continued to see me while they were receiving concurrent care at BHC, especially as they were beginning to notice increasing disability, increasing what we knew later on to be PEM and becoming bedridden for periods of time. And of course, after receiving proper diagnostic care, this individual got a diagnosis of orthostatic intolerance, PEM, and eventually diagnosed with ME-CFS. And this was really a classic case of ME-CFS in my experience. But this all happened five years after they had received this initial psychiatric diagnosis. So Time span from symptom onset to differential diagnosis of ME-CFS was five years, which actually is uncommonly short in my experience working with these folks. Now, you know, five years, years into their care for ME-CFS, this individual is able to ride a horse, which is something they did in their childhood, and they were able to return to that. Um, she's able to drive short distances and even recently relocated about a year ago her and her, her partner, including to have some space away from their unsupportive family members. And said family of origin to this day, per the recent report of this individual, still believe that she's malingering and that she does not actually have a real illness. The other example here, this is assigned female at birth as well, mid-40s white. This person had been given a prior diagnosis of conversion disorder. This person came in to me having kind of cobbled together their own treatment protocol, including using a sea collar just of their own volition because they reported that it improved their subjective symptoms. They were referred by their primary care for mental health care for depression and what their doctor had been concerned were isolating behaviors, essentially. So this person had stopped socializing, had reduced their interaction, was barely maintaining their work life. 
They were moderately ambulatory. They had waxing and waning kind of nonspecific neurological symptoms. So tremors, what they called brain zaps, those sorts of symptoms that they were explaining to me. They had received a normal brain and C-spine MRI. Generally, her biggest complaint, including, you know, regarding what made her depressed, anxious, and wanting to isolate was a feeling of diffuse and chronic pathologic itching. So feeling as though she itched from head to toe and could get no relief and believed that it was impossible to interact, that it was frustrating to engage socially. And then when she did engage socially or go out into the world, she often got questioned or it would cause a huge disruption, the fact that she was in such discomfort. She also experienced frequent bouts of urticaria, flushing, GI distress, and refreshing sleep, pretty frequent insomnia, which also obviously limited her ability to interact with life. During the first few months of seeing this client, the depression and anxiety were pretty unresponsive to therapeutic care. So it was my instinct along the way that there just was more going on here than what had been diagnosed and that her, especially her subjective itching experiences were something that were really suspicious to me and warranted continued care. So I encouraged this client a number of times to go back to their primary care provider and to just ask for a mast cell panel, to ask to have a trip taste done, just to kind of do some of the basic screening. The PCP was a little bit unresponsive and intractable. Several requests that the patient had made they requested an ROI, the patient signed it. I reached out to their PCP and said, I do actually think that this would make sense to try some of these tests. Eventually, their PCP capitulated. And it took, I would say, I think it was about three or four months of convincing between myself and the client to get the PCP to order the tests. And shortly thereafter, the patient reached out to me and said that they had received a diagnosis of systemic mastocytosis. So this person had been sick for a number of years with a pretty significant, unusual and debilitating illness and had just been dismissed by their PCP for having anxiety issues, depression issues, and for being unwilling to engage in life. Um, and at this point, last I checked with this individual, they are currently seeking a differential di diagnosis as well for either CCI or tethered cord as it's clear that there's something going on in their spinal column and in their C-spine that is yet unresolved. But it was pretty profound to see how much resistance this person received trying to get just basic screening tests for what seemed like a pretty clear potentiality. Um, and I'm, I was really glad that she stayed committed to it and that we were able to convince her provider to look a little bit deeper and to consider that there may be something else going on here. So, you know, we spent a lot of time today talking about how to differentiate between what might be the primary psych symptoms or psych symptoms secondary to chronic illnesses that we might see in some of these populations. And I do want to take some time to just mention what are some of the mental health care modalities that are relevant, whether the psych symptoms are co-occurring with the chronic illness, whether the chronic illness is the primary cause of those symptoms. I think regardless of the directionality that we might discover along the way, some of these care methods can be really effective. I do want to say that I think it's really relevant for locating mental health professionals that have training and competency with dis disability psychology, working with chronic illness and medical trauma, and that's not a plug necessarily for my clinic, but just for anyone within that realm that has some competency with this so that they can differentiate and make sure that they're really reaching out and being a part of a collaborative care model with medical providers. So some of the methodologies that have been shown to be quite effective and that I am also anecdotally a fan of, I really like somatic EMDR, eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. This is especially effective for folks who have medical trauma, who have had traumatic experiences related to their health or to healthcare acquisition. Somatic experiencing is another potential method that's a little bit different from EMDR, but also includes a lot of, of mind-body interface. 
ACT or acceptance and commitment therapy, especially when there is an emphasis on somatic experience can be really relevant and helpful. I found this one to be especially effective with clients, particularly around the adjustment to disability and how to integrate that into life. Mindfulness-based cognitive therapy and MBSR or mindfulness-based stress reduction, that can be a great method. DBT-PE, which is DBT with prolonged exposure, this can actually be really helpful if there is pretty severe health anxiety or even the symptoms of obsessive compulsive disorder, which can be secondary to severe health issues, chronic health issues, and the need to be hypervigilant, which can in fact turn into OCD over time. Uh, other models that can work here, brain spotting, mind-body bridging. I really like doing grief and loss work with these folks. So sometimes existential therapy, the work of Francis Weller, there's some really great grief and loss work that can be done and, and different modalities or different theorists that we can pull from along the way. Neurofeedback can also be really effective here. And, and as Jen mentioned earlier, like neuroplastic therapies um, have been shown to work well with these clients. I am also a fan sometimes of TMS, transcranial magnetic stimulation. I've had a few folks that did TMS while also doing care for their MECFS. And in some cases it worked. In other cases, it was a little bit of an ab reaction. So I think proceed with caution when it comes to TMS, especially considering sensory overload potential. I also, you know, I think that there's relevance for ketamine therapies. There's a reason I say CAP versus CAT. CAP is ketamine-assisted psychotherapy. CAT is ketamine-assisted therapy. It's a really subtle terminology, but a really important difference. CAP psychotherapy actually includes usually intramuscular injection of ketamine with immediate assisted therapeutic processing with a licensed provider. So there is actually in vivo therapy processing happening within the window of utilization of the ketamine. And sometimes that's immediately aligned with the intramuscular injection. Other times it's within 24 hours, which is kind of the ideal neuroplastic window. I would not recommend suggesting CAT or ketamine-assisted therapy, which is kind of the pop-up clinic that you may have seen folks go to where they get the intramuscular injection and they're left alone in a room maybe with headphones to listen to music, but otherwise they have no guided processing. Um, I am not a fan of CAT. I think that there can be some problems involved in that. And I have had clients who have had pretty significant ab reactions or just really unpleasant responses uh, to not having someone kind of walk them through what's happening for them while they're doing ketamine therapy. So proceed with caution. And I will say, asterisk, there is emerging data on psilocybin to be determined, right? I would say, ask me in five years or so how that might integrate into the care potentialities for these folks. So lastly, I, I, wanna, I want us to all sort of consider what does this mean for how we can provide better care to our patient populations? And I think some of these are kind of points of, like I said before, sort of calls to action, opportunities for us to work a little bit differently and work together differently. Uh, you know, I think healthcare silos really prevent proper differential diagnosis. And I think our case examples today really highlight that. Oftentimes there is an over-reliance on psych explanations for some of these symptoms. So I really encourage that we obtain ROIs and that we reach out to our fellow providers to screen and, and case consult to make sure that we're not missing something, you know, knowing that our scope of care is limited and that we may need the guidance of our fellow providers, especially the folks that we know and trust most in the community. A lack of communication between providers really restricts comprehensive care. So as much as we can, as much as we can make the time for, we really need to stay in contact regarding our shared patients and just, you know, even a monthly quick check-in, I think, makes all the difference to making sure that a treatment plan is making sense from both the mental health and the medical side. I think that treatment planning can sometimes be myopic without collaboration and overlap. So follow up and follow through, right? Like at whatever pitch we can, how do we make that commitment to have continuity of care across a treatment team, even if it's in distinct provider spaces or different clinics. And again, acknowledging it takes a lot of time to do, to do this. And most of us don't have a lot of time. 
And can we take an extra five or 10 minutes once a month to just make that reach out, take that time. And I also want to say that I think that interdisciplinary care should be standard, not aspirational. You know, I think that we are in systems that limit our ability to be interdisciplinary. We are, we are siloed. This has been the norm for so long. And if you're in a healthcare system that does not standardize interdisciplinary care or doesn't make space for it, consider asking for that, making requests or, or even being an agent of change within your own provider systems if you have that capacity to consider collaborative care models, to actually have mental health and medical working together, sometimes even underneath the same roof, in order to make sure that we're differentiating what might be really going on for our patients. And ideally, we want to source our best reference, right? Know who your allies are. Know who you can go in mental health for your patients. Know, as your, if you're a mental health provider, know who your medical specialists are that understand what might be going on for these populations and make sure that we're making those referrals and re maintaining those trusted referral relationships. Again, these things take time, but they can pay off so profoundly, not just for our patients, but also for our sense of best practice and our ability to say, I don't know. I don't know the answer. I'm not sure. I'm confused. This is overwhelming. There's a lot here. I could use some support. So knowing that we have those relationships where we can seek that support is just so vital. All right. Thank you, everybody. I think we have a little bit of time for questions so we can open up the floor for a moment. Everyone, very helpful. For the first case that was presented, for the patient that was in the ICU, I'm an ICU physician. And so obviously during certain times of COVID, it was even more compromised for people's ability to care for patients because we were super uber overloaded. Was that particular patient intubated during her stay? She was not. So she she was on, I don't know what. what I flow. Biflow, thank you. I know there's a new term from when I was in ICU. <laughs> yeah, she was on Biflow, and so it was really touch and go for a couple of days. And there wasn't, you know, it was just a very traumatic experience. I don't think anything was done inappropriately at all. It just was terrifying, you know, as I think every a lot of people experienced. Yeah. I think also that contributes to that is that the limitations with going in people's rooms and depending on the structure because of the virus spreading, you know, PPE was a bigger issue. We actually closed down the floor and actually turned it into an open ICU so the airflow was all continuous. Those patients, I think, got better social care to some degree because they were people walking in and interacting. Other ways, they were literally sitting in their room for hours a day trying to breathe and not die, which is kind of terrifying. But the reason I ask also is because post-ICU syndrome is well known for a lot of these patients. And I've taken care of a lot of ours in our acute rehab hospital after they were in the ICU and they were getting better. I have not seen a lot of dysautonomia in that patient population, which is interesting. And for the severe ones too, I see that more in the female population, I feel like with the long COVID in contrast to, you know, male, female was pretty well matched with our severe cases in the ICU. So that's kind of an interesting one to think about. But yeah. I think both of you at the presentations today, though, highlight a lot of challenges with diagnosis anchoring, which we see a lot of people hand you a diagnosis. And you're like, sure, that's what that is. Or you think about it and that's, you know, sort of what you get stuck on. And I think people get more into the sunken cost fallacy too of saying, well, I, you know, if I have to go back on what I said, then I feel dumb. But I always feel like COVID is kind of the gift that keeps giving, whether we like it or not. As I felt like that way, as it started out in the ICU, it was like jumping out of the airplane and figuring out the parachute as you got down towards the ground. <laughs> but in a lot of ways, though, it's humbling to be able to say as a provider, like, I don't know, but I'll walk with you through this. Because I think we're, you know, in the way we're socialized, when we're taught often as, you know, in our different care modalities, it's like, that was never really addressed as how do I address something that's totally new that we don't understand. But I think that's the key. And with that case that was, you know, the itchiness, like, I don't know how I would have ever, like, that should have been the light bulb moment, I think, for someone to be like, that doesn't fit with that, you know, and sort of re-examining those diagnoses. But I think that's something we can do to socialize our trainees, though, that are underneath us and say, 
how can we do this better? There's going to be things we don't understand, but amazing presentation, guys. Thanks. Thank you. I feel like I've found in medicine, we just do not like ambiguity, right? And so it's so much easier to find a label. And yet we forget how that label translates for that person for the rest of their life. The question I want to ask Paige and Jennifer here are, speaking of labels, how have you seen this impede the patient's ability to receive adequate care once that's been slapped on? An FND, something like that. And how have you, as a practitioner, overcome that then for that patient? I can start with that. I think I mentioned, you know, what I definitely see kind of the longer term effects is if they have to apply for disability, they have to overcome those diagnoses. And from what I've seen from disability, they are looking and hoping they're going to find a diagnosis like that somewhere in their records, even though maybe it was a one-time diagnosis, it carries a huge amount of weight in terms of patients getting disability. This is from my experience with this. But I also think it's really easy as a provider to default to default to a psychiatric diagnosis when you don't know, and therefore you're not going to be treating that person properly. If if there is an, an alternate reason for this that could be evaluated. I also think it also is very challenging to the patient because they, I think at least these patients know that there's more going on. I'm not just anxious. I'm not just depressed. And something else is going on and nothing is listening to them. And that worsens their trauma. That worsens their, their, their chronicity. We know that emotional exertion worsens post-exertional malaise in these patients. So when we're not, we're not validating this, then I think it can worsen their condition. Paige. Yeah, I would agree. I've, anecdotally seen the most damage done by conversion disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, and anxiety disorder are some of the diagnoses that these folks were given that very frequently barred them from accessing care, especially I've noticed a lot of uh, uh, emergency care Instacare, like when they went in for emergency needs, that if that was on their record, they were often turned away or told that they needed to go talk to their psychiatrist, their psychologist. Um, this is just anxiety. Are you sure you're not just anxious? So those were the kinds of diagnoses that if they had been labeled as such previously, created an incredible incapacitation to receiving proper care, including in the ER. Jenny, there's a question in the chat. Does all neuroleptic or non-epileptic seizures fall under this umbrella or taxonomy of FND? Um, I was looking at that and thinking about how I'd answer that. So I think I I don't know if I, I, I didn't intend to just to suggest that dysautonomia or that is under the umbrella of FND. What I think it can I think functional neurologic disorder, the symptoms that is often attributed to functional neuro neurologic disorder can also be dysautonomia symptoms. And so, such as, say, syncope or presyncope can sometimes, and sometimes people will have epileptic type symptoms when a, va a vagal sort of epileptic response when, when, they, when they have syncope. I think Melanie presented, Dr. Hopters presented a patient not that long ago with, with pseudo, pseudo bulbar, pseudo, pseudo seizures. They, they called them psychogenic seizures. Right. But she improved with mast cell therapy. Right. So I think that if I'm answering your question correctly, I don't believe that, I don't think you can automatically put non epileptic and seizures under FND. I think you have to widen your differential diagnosis and determine that it's not from some other cause. Is it possible to have both FND and one of these other medical diagnoses? 
I would think that's, yeah, I would, I would think there could be, I am not so sure if I can speak to FND that much because I have personally never given a, a diagnosis to anybody. So I don't know if somebody else could speak more on that. Um, in the pulmonary world, I always laugh because I see a lot of people that get labeled with COPD who've never had lung testing or an actual history taken with this. So it's unfortunately not limited to psychiatric disease and other things. Unfortunately, our system is just stressed, but it does label people really bad. But I have definitely seen people like in the pulmonary world, there is people who have asthma and then people who have vocal cord dysfunction, which can then be triggered by anxiety, stress. And I've seen people get fully intubated in the ED for vocal cord dysfunction, which is not a life-threatening thing. It feels life-threatening. So I've definitely, and they tend to coexist with each other. So I would say from that example, likely it could be something that somebody is a psych psychiatric component, but also a physiologic component, and then they can exacerbate each other. Seems very logical to me, but it's the key part is being able to tease that out and tease those things apart and not just label it all as it's all in your head. Here you go. Exactly. I think that you summed that perfectly, Dr. Brown. I think that at least what I'm getting from the lecture is that we need to be careful with what we label and how we go about the differential and that it can look like this and actually be something else, right? Anne, your hand is... Yeah, I'm going to try and see if my voice cooperates. Uh, I've been trying for a while to do a deep dive in FND, which is far from finished. For one thing, it's clear, yes, that it can coexist with other pathologies. FND as a neurological disorder is quite divine and probably interesting. As a personal opinion, what I see currently is that I see a drift from what is known and interesting in FND to broader complex conditions like long COVID, like ME, and that's very concerning. Also, for F and E as defined, there are very interesting results with interventions. From my personal point of view, I'm not certain the premises with Bayesian brain and stuff are really explanatory what's going on but fact is they do have results so that's interesting to dig in and try to understand one of the problems i see is that rather than asking themselves why the intervention would not work in a given patient what i see is they don't ask themselves that they say patient didn't believe enough or didn't want it and that for me is a big red flag because we don't have the tools yet to differentiate between different conditions and who will respond to the interventions and not. Very well said. Paige, I want to ask you one more question before we wrap and then we'll go to Dr. Bateman. On the slide where you were Listing out some of the modalities, are there any contraindications that you have for those with CFS or dysautonomia as it relates to those? Yeah, I think one thing overarching as a suggestion is that mental health therapies make sense at a certain juncture of the care trajectory. So I'm not going to be doing mental health care with someone who is critically ill and needs significant medical stabilization. I would say almost all of these are going to be potentially contraindicated until the basic medical stabilization is on board, barring the need for crisis care, right? If somebody is in need of crisis care concurrently with their medical care, sometimes we can make that work, but crisis modalities are going to look different. For instance, with EMDR, there's something called ATIP that's totally different from EMDR because EMDR is not recommended when someone is in a crisis situation. So I think it's really about kind of finding the ideal window of tolerance wherein mental health care can be folded into the treatment plan 
um, at the point where a person is medically stabilized to a reasonable extent. And it is case by case, but we want to make sure that we're not overburdening the body, overstimulating the brain, the nervous system. So it's really important to work with medical and mental health care providers to make a plan about how to do that folding in at the right time and, and right interval. Thank you. Dr. Bateman and then Dr. Brown. Okay, not sure we have enough time. I just was reading on functional neurologic disease and I thought it was interesting because S Sigmund Freud called it conversion order disorder because he believed it was a psychological disorder that had become a neurologic one. And I think it's well intended to give these names. The problem is we use them as in medicine as code, secret code for I can't help you with anything, right? There's nothing we can do for you. And I would say, it says that the two primary categories, as you said, are psychogenic non-epileptic seizures and functional movement disorder. I'll tell you, I've seen both of those neurologic manifestations frequently in our MECFA, MECFS population because they have neuroinflammation and then they have they have abnormal brain perfusion. And I really think they get symptoms from variable perfusion in the brain. And we've been able to elicit these symptoms doing lean testing and they do respond to treatment. So the main reason I think it's important to dig in is that there might be things you can do, right? And by when you've done everything you can and you still think there's a mental health component, then you continue to deal with it. So I don't think it has to be either or. Um, I just wanted to, before we wrap up in two seconds, I am presenting in April for this ECHO series, and I would love to, if you guys have any questions about supplements, because these are like, this is like the Wild West, which is, I think is funny because we're here in Utah, but like, I get questions all the time about supplements, and so I was going to present on that, but if you guys have any specific questions on ones you're seeing I'll try to pull up as much literature as I can. Unfortunately, there's not a lot, but just kind of making providers aware of what people are able to get in the community and what they're using, what the potential pros and cons so we can have good conversations with our patients. So feel free to send me those or message me or any of those things. But I just thought that would be a fun topic for our next one because it's something I get asked about a lot and there's been some new stuff out as well. Great. Thank you, Dr. Brown. And you can email me and I will certainly make sure it gets to her. Thank you for a wonderful presentation today. And just a reminder, claim the CME by midnight tonight. And we look forward to seeing you in April. Take care. <laughs>